Why those songs? Oh, it's a wonderful time of the year, isn't it? Amen. Oh, just, wait a minute. Am I the only one that enjoys this time of the year? But it can be stressful too, can't it? It's a time to rejoice, a time to be happy, and uh, oh, it's a wonderful time. I love the, the lights and the colors and just the, the, the fellowship and all that comes from this time of the year. A time to rejoice. Shirley and I, a couple years ago, I think, maybe it was last year, maybe two years ago, about this time of the year, driving back from over the mountain, and, and we're coming through Walterville. And off on the left, I don't know what kind of a church, there's a little white church off on the side of the road there in Walterville. And as we're driving along, I'm looking and saying, hey, look, a couple of deacons out there in the parking lot. And uh, Shirley, look at that. In a fist fight. Mm. In a fist fight in the church parking lot. I said, oh, I've seen that before. You know, they were probably just Christmas greetings. I don't know, I don't know what was going on. Thank talking you, politics or something. I don't know. But somehow, the joy was gone with those two fellows. And uh, it just, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. I mean, of all the places in the church parking lot, earth is going on. But such things do happen. Our joy can be taken away from us. Doesn't the devil look for every opportunity to rob us of that joy? Mm -hmm. Yes, he does. does not miss an opportunity to push a button, to do something, to say something, whatever, to try and rob us of that joy. Take your Bibles and turn, if you would, to Philippians, because we're still in that, you know, I should be on a Christmas theme, I'm going to get there eventually here in December, but, um, you know, Paul's talking about joy in the book of Philippians, and, and if you've not been here week by week, I, I took this opportunity to go through the book of Philippians, because the crisis in our world, the things that are just crazy, 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 and how do we deal with those things, and I thought, well, Paul was a man who lived a life of pressure and stress and chaos, and yet was able to talk joy in the midst of that. I thought, well, that's a message that we definitely need to look at. We're in chapter 4 of Philippians, and we all probably have different versions, but mine is this one, the New King James I'm reading from this morning. Therefore, verse 1, chapter 4, Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my crown and joy, stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Yodia and I implore Sinchi, or however you say it, to be the same, um, to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true, true companion, to help these women who labor with me. Um, somebody else has a different version. Verse 2, can you read that? I'm, verse 2 it implores them to do what? to stop arguing to get along different versions say different but here were two ladies and I can't hardly even pronounce their names but he says I urge you get along and he said it's just so embarrassing when you get into those fist fights in the parking lot of the church Paul was aware these, these things happened. And in chapter 1, when we were going through, he was talking about the problems in the church in Rome. They were having arguments and discussions and heated discussions. And here were two ladies who were not getting along. And he's saying, come on, ladies, what's, what's wrong here? You've got to work this out. Well, do you ever find joy being robbed because you can't get along with somebody. And it's the people we're closest to that often we don't get along with, right? The people that are closest to us are the ones that we find we rub against and get a little irritated with. And certainly in church, it's no different. 
the people that we get along with, uh, or should be getting along with, are the ones that, that can irritate us. Yeah. I urge you. I urge you. To verse 4, I urge you to rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be, gentleness be known to all, for the Lord is at hand. When it says, for the Lord is at hand, what do you think that's saying? Rejoice because God is... With us. What? With us. With, it, can be go, it can go both ways. Rejoice because God is with us. Or rejoice because He's coming, he's coming soon. It goes both ways. It works both ways. And it is valid both ways. Rejoice because God is with us. Rejoice. He's coming soon. His coming is, is close at hand. Well, Paul's trying to help us deal with things that rob our joy. And uh, he's going to speak to us this morning as we look at this chapter 4, or at least part of the, the chapter. Things that rob us of our joy. What kind of things? Well, there's a whole bunch of them. And, uh, well, no. th there's no end. Health, sickness, and finances, people, all kinds of things can rob us. And what, what happens when you start to worry, when you start to stress, and when you begin to lose joy? What happens to your body? You get sick. When you begin to get stressed, emotionally stressed, and you begin to worry and fret and stew, your body begins to respond. It just, you can't get away from it. it it's connected. Headaches and backaches and ulcers and neck pains and all kinds of ailments and different things. You don't think as clear as you should. And, and it, it just nothing is working. Nothing is working the way it should. When you worry, when you are stressed, You know what? I'm going to stop for just not because of that. I just have to stop for a minute here. What day is today? The Sabbath. What is the most wonderful thing about Sabbath for you? Rest. Spiritual retreat. And you're resting. I'm sorry, I'm just glancing across here and I'm, Thank you. And I'm thinking, I'm not connected with anybody. You're all just... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, it doesn't look like Sabbath to me. And we had some wonderful songs. Yeah. And you're still moping. <laughs> don't fall asleep on me. You're at peace. Oh, I don't know. Stand up for a minute, please. Yeah, yeah, stand up. Now, not everybody can participate because some of you are the feet problems, and I don't know the cast is still on, and all the issues and things. And some of you, your bones and muscles don't work, but others of you are healthy. And you're gonna, we're gonna all together, we're gonna jump and say, Praise the Lord. Okay? Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. <laughs> huh? One more time. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. I can be seated. <laughs> and now your frowns are gone. You've got a smile. <laughs> Sabbath, we talked about this last Sabbath. Sabbath is a time to come together and rejoice. Rejoice. Amen. We, and, and, Robert, the thing that you read for, for just a at prayer time, can you imagine having a baby in your arms? We sang a song about it. Having a child, Mary, having a child in her arms and kissing that child and realizing this little baby that I'm holding in my arms created the universe. This is God, divinity. And and the priest holding that child in the temple. This is my redeemer. This baby is going to live for me. He's going to die for me. He's going to save me. And 
one day this little baby is going to be coming in the clouds of glory and take me to, you know. Incredible. Incredible to think about. And that's the God that we come to on Sabbath. We're in his presence and he comes to us. And he comes to us with that same message of hope and of healing and of love. God is so good to us. And Paul is trying to communicate to that that, that point is that we come together in fellowship during the week and here on Sabbath, we come together and it's a time to rejoice. Sometimes we're not happy with one another and that's not an issue here and I'm thankful for that, but, but sometimes we come together and we're not always getting along and things are stressful at home, you know, and family members. It's not always joyful. Problems at work and problems everywhere and in the nation and crisis and Paul had been through that all and in the midst of it all he said you can still have joy he'd been with the people in Rome when they were fighting and these two ladies here he said come on get along he was in jail and he was not sure whether he was going to lose his head or not you know he was he was looking at the possibility that I'm going to die soon. And he still said, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. And that's, that's the message of Christ that he brings to us day after day, is that things might be difficult where you live, in your home, but there's still an opportunity and a need to rejoice. When we do not rejoice, when we lose our focus, when we begin to worry and stress, it's because we have taken our eyes off of Jesus, God, and we've begun to look at ourselves. When you worry, you've taken your eyes off of God and you begin to look at yourself. When you worry, you begin to take your eyes off of Christ and you look at people and you look at circumstances and you look at all of these frustrations and you begin to look at yourself about how you feel. Those things make me feel bad and we begin to worry, we begin to stress. Those situations and those things and those people are unpleasant. We look to self and we think, we think about ourselves and how it makes us feel and we start to feel bad. We look to ourselves as the person who has to fix these things and it seems impossible and so we begin to worry, we begin to stress. It's all because we take our eyes off of Christ and we begin to focus on ourselves. That we begin to worry and our joy is lost. Anyway, Paul begins to give us some answers here in chapter 4. Um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 through 6. You've got it in the Bible, you can look at yours, but I've got it on the screen. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Let your gentleness be known and be anxious for nothing. Three things he says that we should do. Three things. How we verbalize what we talk about, how we act, and how we think. Three things that he, he tells us. Three things that uh, we need to focus on to be the kind of people that, that have joy in our life. Paul is coming, he says, rejoice in the Lord always, meaning, and he was, like I said, he was in the midst of problems all the time, but he's saying, you know what, talk about things that are positive. Yes, the world is filled with negative things, but talk positive, there's always good. Talk about the goodness of God, praise God, thank God, you know, you can start making lists of things that you're thankful for, and you're, you might say, I have nothing to be thankful for. The truth is that you do have things to be thankful for. We have clothes, and we're warm, and we have teeth that we can chew our food. We have eyes that we can see, and ears that we can hear, and we have hair on our head. Well, some of you have hair on our head. You know, it just, there are things that we have that we just take for granted. We can be thankful for. And that's what Paul was talking about rejoice in the Lord always. The difficulties, we're going to get into some of this, but the difficulties that come. 
I'm not saying Pollyanna and just ignore everything, but even your difficulties are opportunities to learn, to trust, and to be stronger. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this situation. And until you choose to take it away from me, I'm going to look for ways to rejoice about what you brought to me. Anyway, God wants to help us to, to look at ways. He's, he's giving us these opportunities to be different, to, to be the people, to have joy. So he tells us, rejoice always. Let your gentleness be known. Be calm. No matter what is happening around you, he says, you can be calm. You don't have to uh, beat each other up in the parking lot. And in verse 6 it says, be anxious for nothing. Mm. That is such a hard thing to do. Uh, we are warriors, aren't we? If you do those things, if you are careful about what you say, if you're careful, careful about how you act and behave and how you think, if you do those things, Paul is saying, you will have the peace of God. It will surpass all understanding and it will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. The word guard is a, a word, it's a military use of the word. It means stake soldiers around, like a fortress, and, and here were the, the guards that stand. It's a military term in the Greek. God will protect your heart and your mind if you allow him to, and allow you to, to have the strength and the courage and the joy that you desire. God will do those things for us if we cooperate with him and participate in that. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. The world can't understand. The world doesn't know what it means to have peace, true peace. But God can bring that to us. Well, be anxious for nothing. Worrying. How do you stop your mind from worrying. You know, so often you get up and, and you hear a sermon of a preacher and myself or somebody else gets in front of you and says, well, stop worrying. Stop worrying. How do you stop worrying when it just keeps going round and round and round in your mind? Look at this verse. Be anxious for nothing in everything by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. How do you stop worrying? Give it to God. Pardon? Give it to God. Give it to God. It, it is so simple, and yet, yet, why do we not do that? Your Bible might say, Philippians 4, 6, your Bible might say, be careful for nothing. I don't know if you have your Bible open. Does anybody have it where it says, instead of being anxious for nothing, it says be careful for nothing? <clears throat> Jay says that. Yours? It's so strange. When I looked at that, I, I preach out of, I have a Bible here that I use for preaching. My one at home that I'm studying with and preparing sermons, uh, I should get them both the same because it's a totally different version. My one at home says careful. Be anxious for nothing. Be careful for nothing. I thought, why would they? They seem like two totally different words. What on earth is going on here? Paul's talking about getting along, not letting your joy be taken from you, and saying, here's how you do it. Be careful what you talk about. Be careful how you act. Be careful how you think. And your joy will not be taken from you. And, he, and so he says, be anxious for nothing. Well, yeah. I stopped being anxious. The word careful in your Bible is the same word as anxious, but the word careful really is a better description of what Paul's talking about. Be careful for
for nothing. Care for nothing yourself. The word careful means careful. It's paying attention to it, paying close attention, hovering over it. You are taking care of it. If you don't want your joy to be robbed, if you don't want to be caught up in worry and stress and all those things, stop caring for your problems. Stop taking care of your problems. Not that they go away, but stop being the one who thinks that you've got to have the solution. Stop being the one who thinks that it's all about you. Stop being the one who manages your life. Stop. But in everything, do what? Hand it over to God. Jesus was in a boat with his disciples, and a storm came up. It must have been a horrendous, horrendous storm. Because the water was washing over. And I've seen some of those boats. And, uh, and they're very solid and very stable. And they have a pretty high side of them. And you take some pretty big waves to splash over those boats. And here the disciples were bailing. And they were worried about that boat sinking. And finally they said, we need every man on deck. We need everybody to start bailing. Where, geez, where's Jesus? He's up in the front, that little bit of covered area, on the nets and the cushions and things. He's up there sleeping, screaming and yelling. Somebody went up there, Jesus, Jesus, come on, help us. We're going to drown. The boat's going to sink. And Jesus gets up and looks around, and he said what? Yeah, where's your faith? What's wrong? What's wrong with you guys? And then he stands, climbs up on that front deck, and he stands there and he raises his hands and he says, Peace be still. Peace. Period. Be still. When I was preparing this and I was looking at that, I thought, wait a minute. He, this is just my wild imagination. I, I pictured him not saying, Peace be still. I pictured him standing up and saying to the storm, Peace. I am peace. Storm, peace stands before you. Peace. You are in the presence of peace. I am peace. Isn't that one of his names? Mm -hmm. Prince of peace. I am peace. And storm, you have to obey me. Be still. And, and that's the same Jesus that comes to us. And he says to us, Stop caring for your problems. Stop being the one who thinks you have to settle that storm. And he comes to us and he says, I am peace. And when Christ comes and lives in your heart, who comes to live in your heart? Peace comes, the Prince of Peace. And when a storm comes and you think your boat is going to sink, what does that mean? Prince of Peace do if he's dwelling in your heart? Calms is he the going storm. to let you sink? No. no. Calms no. the storm. Are the waves going to come over the boat? No. Yes. Are you going to drown? No. No. Are the waves coming over the boat? Yes. Are you going to sink? No. Because you have peace dwelling in you. And so here's what, what Paul is trying to do is help us understand Wow, he says, here is the secret to not losing your joy, no matter what goes on. Stop being the one who thinks you have to fix all the problems and hand it over. Be careful for nothing. Be anxious. Stop worrying and fretting. Not that we're not concerned. We have to have concern. It's just that's our responsibility. I'm concerned. But what do I do? What is the proper thing to do with those concerns? Hand it over to God through prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Hand it over to God and then let Him 
help out with that. You know, I, I shared a story last Saturday night. We had a, a church get together, a game night. Thank you for coming. It was such a fun time, good fellowship. But I shared a story. Russell Stendhal shared his story. He was a, in South America, in Colombia. He was a mission pilot, and he got um, captured one day. They were one of the rebels wanted to take him and hold him for ransom. And as they took him and off into the jungles, and he had a pistol strapped to his foot that they failed to uh, take away from him. And when he had an opportunity, he pulled that gun out and shot the man who was guarding him. Shot him in the chest and shot him in the head. And the whole story is about his experience down there and what happened. But in the end, Russell is telling how that he was trying to fix his problem. He was trying to save himself, trying to resolve. He was worried. He thought he was going to die. He just didn't know what was going on. He said, I've got to save myself. And he pulled his gun out. Boom, boom. Well, they still held him and he didn't get away. And the man that he shot survived. And the story goes on to tell how that man who he shot, through the months that they held Russell, that man came to uh, accept Jesus Christ, gave his heart to the Lord. You too. And the other men that were there, part of this group that was holding him captive, they all gave their hearts to the Lord. And he looked at it, and in the end, as he reflected on that whole thing, he says, I was trying to save myself. God was trying to save those men. When we try and take control, we're out of sync with, with God. He has a plan. And if we're not in sync with God, our plan and his plan can be at odds and, and it just wouldn't work out so well. And that's what God is trying to teach us to do here is listen to him. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, says the Lord. For the heavens are as high. For as the heavens were higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I am so glad that God has solutions and answers higher than mine, bigger, mm -hmm. grander than mine. I'm so glad I'm not the one that has to figure out the answers and the solutions. God is the one who does that, and I'm so glad for that. So just to review a second here, the things that we looked at just a second ago that we just read, God asks us to pray. Paul is telling us, here's what you do. Three things, he says. You come to God and you pray. And that's just plain communication. Here's how to, to hold on to joy, not let it be robbed from us. How do you have that relationship where you're not anxious and worried? He's saying, you pray. By everything with prayer. It's just simple communication. You've got to talk to God. You've got to spend time with him and communicate, not only talking to him, but spend time listening. And you know how that works? That listening part? People say, well, how do you hear the voice of God? I've never heard a voice from the Lord, but he has spoken to me. You get your Bible out and you open it up. And as you read, as you get your Bible, as you're reading through, you are praying. And as you're reading the verses and you're going through the Gospels or wherever you're reading, you're, you're doing it with prayer. God, speak to me today. And so you're reading along and a verse will jump out and it will, will just speak to you and it will say something. Yeah, that's, that's just the word of encouragement that I needed today. Try it. It'll happen. God communicates through his word. Get it out. And as you read the scriptures, pray and, uh, and God will communicate with you. The next thing he asked us to do is supplication. With prayer and supplication, that is making petitions. Petitioning God. And it's not always just asking God for things. Sometimes I think the, the greatest and the best petition is asking God, God, what do you want me to do? Petitioning him. Lord, show me what I should be asking for. What should I be praying for? What is your will for my life? In um, coming to the Lord and, and 
lifting up our petitions, asking him to, to guide us and bless us. Now, if you are praying to God, and he's communicating with you, and if you're lifting up your prayer requests mm -hmm. and supplicating, you know, the giving these requests, praying for people or situations or whatever, if you are praying to God, and God is the divine being that he is, the creator of all the universe, the God who heals and restores and, and to a God that you truly believe in and you ask him and submit a petition does he hear you? Yes he does. Is he going to answer you? Yes. So if you pray and if you give him a petition and if you know he hears and he's willing and capable to answer what would be the next thing we would want to do? Thank him. Thank him. Give thanks. And that's what Paul says. In everything, whenever you are anxious and worrying and concerned, go to God in prayer, give him your prayer requests, your supplications, and have confidence in the God that you are praying to. And give thanks even before you get the answer. I don't know how the answer will come or when it will come, but God hears and he answers. We give our petitions to a God who answers. That same book that was on the screen here a second ago, the story that I told for worship last Saturday night about Russell Standish, Stanley, Standish, I guess. Stendhal, that's it. A, a little boy, three years old, his dad was teaching him about God and teaching him about prayer. And, and so he just believed. His dad taught him there's a God who hears and answers prayer. And he had been given a gift of a plant had bloomed and he was concerned about it and so oh yeah dad wonderful god hears me he answers prayer great the kid gets down on his knees three years old gets down on his knees right in front of his dad and prays oh thank you god that you hear and answer prayers please make my plant bloom after we come home by the time we come home from church today and dad was worried because he taught about god and his son believed, even got on his knees and prayed. And he was, dad was so fearful that now his son would come home and <laughs> the dad had looked at the plant. There's no blooms on the plant. It's nowhere near ready to bloom. What will my son do now who has prayed in faith to God and his flower isn't going to bloom? What will he think about God? He'll never pray to God again. Anyway, the dad takes him to church and they go out to eat and they go to the park and dad's stalling him and trying to just distract him and keep him from thinking about that plant and they get home and the kid runs in and looks at his plant it's and it's covered with blooms <laughs> and the kid says great and goes off and plays and as Russell tells the story he says his dad sat there all afternoon staring at that plant you know, trying to figure out how did you do that God <laughs> but, but that's what what God is trying to teach us is that come to him, pray, give our petitions, open up our heart, and give thanks. Because God will bring an answer. God will hear and he will answer. You know, how he does it and when, those are the excuses that we make. And we say, oh, well, must not have asked in the right way and all that. We make excuses. Have more faith. And if you don't see an answer, don't give up. Don't give up. Go back to God and say, God, help me understand. Teach me how to be patient. Lord, show me how you are beginning to answer this. Lord, I've asked for it in a particular way, and that's where we get into the problem. We, we go to God and we ask, tell him what we want and when we want it and how we want it. I think we should go and ask God differently. God, here's my situation. Thank you for the answer. I'm going to leave it to you how you want to answer it and when you want to. Leave it to God. And we get into trouble and we, we get discouraged because we give him all of the conditions. He may have a different way of answering our prayers. skip that one. 
in the end, what Paul is talking about. He goes on after he says, you know, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then he jumps down to verse 9. And the peace of God will be with you. In between there, there's a whole bunch of other things uh, that you're familiar with. It goes on to say in verse 7 and 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true and noble and just and pure and of good report and virtue and praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Who do th these things, the noble things, the true things, the just, the lovely, the pure, who does that describe? God. Jesus. What Paul is telling us, he says, Focus your attention on Jesus and on his goodness and on his mercy, his good track record. You know, the good report. All oh, the, the, the evidences of God over and over again. Paul is saying, focus on God. Keep your eyes focused on God. And I picture God standing there saying, getting our attention. Hey, 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 well, you know, that kind of a thing. Look at me, look at me. We have to quit looking to ourselves to be the fixer of our problems. Right. Quit looking to ourselves as being the one who has to come up with a solution. And take our concerns and our worries, take them to God, focus our attention on the Lord. And verse 9, these things, you've learned them, you've embraced it, now do them, and the peace of God will be with you. Take action, he says. It's not just knowledge. You've got to embrace it and follow through with it. Pray. Send your petitions to the Lord and give him thanks, and the peace of God will be with you. Let's pray. Lord, that's what we need this morning is more peace. As as our world collapses around us, the chaos that we are faced with. Father, you've promised to bring peace as we focus our attention on you. And so, Father, forgive us for looking to ourselves so often and, and trying to be the fixer of all of our problems and the solution. We turn to you today and acknowledge that you are the God who has the answers. You are the God of peace. And we invite you to come into our hearts. Bring us the peace that we desire and that we need. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Thank you so much for being here today. If you can stay with us and for lunch today. Thank you.